Good evening my wonderful friends welcome to my channel so we are on rahu and ketu study part 13 now we come to the aries libra axis in the zodiac right because rahu is now getting into libra in vishakha nakshatra now the word vishakha shakha means a branch like the branches of a tree Vishakha is the unifying force of that branch where it splits from so right off the bat you should understand anything which rahu when it comes and sits in vishakha wants to have an unconventional approach to solving problems of their life trying to find the unifying forces to opposing or divergent forces and trying to find the unifying part of it okay that's vishakha and rahu will do it in an unconventional way the only thing about rahu and ketu you got to understand right off the bat is it's unconventional it's not the straight way of doing things it will try to find a different approach not conventional rahu is anything but conventional okay and so the dispositor of rahu will also what energy it will take in this case if it centers in libra but the first one is i think scorpio fourth pada so mars the remaining three padas in libra is all about that dispositor energy being rooted through the rahu always remember this about rahu and ketu the dispositor is giving you that color to rahu rahu by himself is just unconventional headless well bodyless so you got to understand that about rahu where it goes to and on the other side the opposite side the ketu axis goes from kritika to bharani in aries this is where we are doing so let's get into it right away and if you have seen my earlier videos of introduction to what exactly rahu and ketu is what why do we need to worry about such things in life you do and uh, we can skip the introduction part if you have seen before otherwise i suggest you go through it just like a recap and then we'll get into the pie chart okay so let's get into it so number 1 the classical characteristics of rahu and ketu as described by the classical vedic literature okay what is rahu and ketu these are the north and the south nodes of the moon found by the virtual points which are the intersection points between orbit of the moon around the earth and orbit of the earth around the sun so basically if you take two eclipses ellipses it will form two intersection points yeah so these two intersection points are called the north node and the south node they are virtual nodes although they behave like planets and we shall see why in a minute so who is rahu the symbols are there like a horseshoe and the reverse horseshoe right this is typically how it is portrayed in western astrology so i'm using the same symbol here Rahu is mythologically depicted as the severed head of a demon symbolizing constant endless insatiable hunger and appetite be it sensual or physical yet it is unable to hold on to or grasp it rahu is the one who constantly wants something think of it as a live head only not the body okay so it can't hold on to anything or be satisfied even if it gets that thing since it has no arms or body or stomach right? just a head which is alive this gives rahu the title of bhoga karaka or meaning one who is after sensory materialistic pursuits so think any earth sign for example they want sensory materialistic pursuits or think any of the signs literally whatever they are after rahu wants that and wants that very badly and goes after it with everything this is an energy in us by the way it is not a planet it's a virtual node but it will behave like a planet which we shall see why so it is unable to satisfy that hunger or hold on to anything even though it gets something it wants to move on to the next and then to the next and then to the next this is why varahu is also called as the guy who wants foreign things not of the native land or not of what the person is natively born in why because of that insatiable hunger there is always insatiable hunger to go after one thing after the another without being able to hold on to it that's rahu 
Ketu, on the other hand, is mythologically depicted as the severe body, the remaining half of the demon, symbolizing constant, endless, insatiable search for identity. It is looking for the head, but it doesn't have a head. So it is looking for that identity. Everybody's identity, ego is centered in the head, what you look like, right? It is also seeking for true purpose, sense of self. As a result of this, it tries to hold and grab on to everything that it can find its hands on because it has got hands. Ketu has got hands. It's trying to hold on to everything, but it releases immediately because it knows that's not the head. It's like trying to grasp on to everything, thinking, oh, I want this, or I am this, I am that, I am this. Not getting any identity because it's not finding the head there. Since it has arms and walks everywhere, it goes around through life, walking from place to place, people, situations, circumstances, but not knowing who or what it is. It doesn't have a head. This is why Ketu is referred to as Mokshakaraka or the seeker's path, the one energy in us which seeks something. That's why Ketu is called the Mokshakaraka. Now, this is the classical interpretation. Okay. Now we shall see how this plays out in the modern interpretation. Very important to connect the bridges. Now here you have the Rahu Ketu general characteristics as modern interpretation. This I have borrowed from the book uh, Light on Life by Robert Suva, an excellent book. I have put it in the community tab if you want to go through it or purchase it and read it. I seriously suggest that. Okay, the North Node of the Moon, Rahu. What does it become because of the characteristics which classically is told in the texts? What does Rahul lead to in the modern context? Rahu is responsible for originality, individuality, independence, insight, ingenuity, inspiration and imagination on the positive side. Because Rahu and Ketu both love to explore foreign stuff, things out of the box, things not taught by tradition, Rahu and Ketu will be anything but traditional. Okay? Think of it as something foreign to the culture, to the way you are taught things. Looking for original stuff. If there is one singular force that is responsible for creating everything that we keep modernizing, so to speak, thinking out of the box, it is this. That's why it's important to pay attention to this. Okay, back to this. So Rahu on the downside becomes leads to confusion, escapism, neurosis, psychosis, deception, addiction, vagueness, illusion and delusion. This is the downside. Now how this plays out and why we will have to see individually in the charts. We shall, we shall see that. Okay, Ketu. Ketu, the guy with only the body, no head there, is gives us the feeling of universality, impressionability, idealism, intuition, compassion, spirituality, self-sacrifice, subtleness, on the positive side. On the downside, it can lead to eccentricity, fanaticism, explosiveness, violence, unconventionality, amorality, iconoclasm, impulsiveness and emotional tensions. This is on the downside. This is what it plays out and Rahu Ketu is typically an axis like it is shown over there. right? Rahu Ketu, let me remove myself for the time being from that axis. Okay, There you are. So you see it as an Access, okay 180 degrees apart and it can play out in any one of the opposite houses it can play out in 1 7 2 8 3 9 4 10 etc etc it can be, you'll see that later but this axis becomes a definition point of where in your life in your different houses are you looking for these two aspects and they are always opposite to each other as you can see okay to stand opposite to each other so if it plays out in second house it detaches itself from the 8th house. If Rahu is in 2nd house, it, Ketu will be in the 8th house. You see what I mean? And so you will bring the 8th house aspect with these aspects shown here. 2nd house with that aspect shown over there. Of course, it plays out with something called as dispositors. We shall see that next. Now, if you go to a traditional Vedic astrology, they will go on and on endlessly about dispositors. What the hell is a dispositor? It's an invented term by the Vedic astrologers. It has no meaning of its own. It shows the disposition and what's the story on this. Rahu and Ketu both are enemies of the sun and the moon. This is the basic principle. So it has the solar aspect and the lunar aspect. The solar aspect is called the dispositor and the lunar aspect is the nakshatra which gives the entire characteristics and the ball game of Rahu and Ketu. Okay. 
the solar or the dispositor means since rahu and ketu are enemies with the sun and do not have a full identity of their own remember it's a virtual node it is not a planet they both do not have any planetary characteristic individually so they take on the identity or the disposition of the lord of the zodiac sign that they sit in and borrow the attributes of the house from which that lord sits in suppose mercury is in the third house okay and rahu sits in the house of mercury somewhere else so it will borrow the attributes of mercury sitting in that third house and bring it to that particular house wherever rahu is sitting in got it nakshatras since rahu and ketu are enemies with the moon and do not have a full identity of their own individually they take on the shade of personality nakshatra is essentially a shade of personality it's coloring of a personality it's seeing the world through different colored glasses that they sit in and borrow the nakshatra traits and attributes which color their propensities so rahu and ketu do two things at the same time at the solar level it goes with the dispositor that is all of the planets physical planets mercury mars venus sun moon so on so they take on the attributes of whichever house they are sitting if it sits in rahu sits in cancer it will you have to look for where moon is sitting which house and what it is doing there and even the moon nakshatra if it is sitting in leo rahu in leo that means it you have to look for where sun is sitting and which nakshatra and which house so it will bring those attributes that's the way you have to analyze this okay let's see some aspects of which house they play in and why now there are some vital aspects that you keep, need to keep in mind when evaluating rahu and ketu because this is important for, especially for people who are sort of looking for self development to understand where they are coming from if you're not interested in changing yourself this entire channel is useless for you but if the other one who is interested in knowing what is happening in my life where do i need to go what are my talents and you question these kinds of things excuse the noise somebody is drilling about so then you need to understand these aspects now that's the typical chart indian chart and house numbers are depicted as 1 2 3 4 to up till 12 dharma artha kama moksha is there and i have stuck rahu ketu as possible axis on the 1 7 that is aries and libra that is the top and the bottom so either it can go to house number 1 or 7 rahu ketu can be reversed it's okay it doesn't matter or in 4 and 10 now 1 4 7 and 10 in vedic astrology are given very vital importance because they are the foundational aspects that define who you are that define how you operate in life throughout life so these become crucial why the one seven axis effects if rahu and ketu fall on there has a direct effect on your self and other concept one and seven is self and other how you re- relate to yourself and how you relate look at the world around you as others including the spouse because seventh house is the house of the spouse but also others so how you develop through life and how you develop a relationship with others so it defines who you are in a very broad sense one seven axis of rahu ketu the four ten on the other hand fourth house being the house of the mother tenth being father fourth being home tenth being career you see this has a you know all kinds of implications which define who you are the four ten axis has effects on the heart versus mind mind wants to, is the one who goes out there in the world and being used in the career right you dissipate your energy as the mind in the external world heart is your home your home center where you feel comfortable home is where the heart is that kind of a thing so heart and home is affected by this rahu ketu axis again rahu and ketu might be reversed rahu might be in the fourth ketu might be in the tenth or vice versa same way with one and seven but these are the vital relating aspects of rahu and ketu now what about the rest of the houses now rest of the houses are called trikona or kona in sanskrit right these are the things that come and go in your life they let be second house third house fifth house sixth eighth ninth eleventh and twelfth these are the things that come and go in our life through life through your entire life these are things that are added into subtracted from us but this is not us 1 4 7 and 10 is us everything else is secondary which revolves around you as life comes and goes 
all other axes depict what attachments and detachments we have towards different areas of our life. That's all it is. They are less significant in terms of Rahu and Ketu when compared to 1, 7, 4 and 10 axes of Rahu and Ketu. Please remember this. When you are evaluating, you just have more propensity towards one part of life and less towards others. Rahu is attachment, Ketu is detachment. Rahu is expansion, Ketu is reduction. And they stand opposite to each other all this. Right? Now let's take the cases one by one. So there you have it, the axis. Now I stuck a white circle so you can see that Rahu and Ketu. This side, on the downside is Rahu, what you can see. So again, we are talking in Navamsha about the Cancer Capricorn axis, the tussle between the mind and the heart. Capricorn is the mind, Cancer is the heart. Mother, father. Okay, think of that. The solstices, the two solstice points. Okay, so what does it do in the first one? Now, in the first one, it is still in the in the first pada of Scorpio, right? It is still in the pada of Scorpio, as you can see, Anuradha, right? And there's something a little bit of a shading thing there going on. But anyway, as you can see in the table over there, the little tiny table I've stuck, it is. Scorpio going into Cancer and on the Ketu side of the things there's Aries going into Sagittarius so on the one side we have two water signs on the other side Ketu side we have two fire signs so this axis will have a lot of emotion in Ketu which it is struggling with a lot of emotion it is detached from the emotion and on the Rahu side it wants to go and feel the emotion in the Ketu side, it is detached from the fire, from the passion of things, from the drive. It lacks drive to fulfill things. Now, you've got to understand the theme of Vishaka. When we stick Rahu into Vishaka, what is Vishaka themes about? Unifying forces. Working to have single-mindedness. Their life purpose becomes to have single-mindedness. They are always caught between problem of choices. Sometimes we have problem of choices. What do I choose? Do I, do I choose this career path or this career path? This partner or this partner? This is Vishakha theme. Okay? Especially if it happens in ascendant. Problem of multiple choices. They are trying to work through choices. They have a very determined mind. They can do things. They can accomplish things. But they need to make up their mind. Make up your mind. Okay? That's the fourth pada. The third one. Let's see what the third one is. Right, so in the third pada, in Vishakha, Rahu enters the Gemini Sagittarius axis, the Guru and the Shishya, the teacher and the student axis. So Rahu is still in the student axis. Again, go with the birth chart first. We are talking about the dispositors of Venus, Libra and Taurus, Venus again. So both Taurus and Venus, why Taurus and Venus? I think we are still in the, sorry, this we have already gone to Aries. The second and the third Pada are Taurus of Kritika. Okay, so we have come to the first Pada of Kritika. I think there is a mistake there. The first Pada of Kritika is in Aries, not Taurus. So Aries is going into Libra, meaning Mars as the dispositor of Ketu. If Mars becomes a dispositor of Ketu, it has a lot of drive, but Ketu becomes detached from it, so it wants to stay away. They take their internal power, they take their drive for granted. Ketu takes things for granted. And Rahu, who wants to achieve stuff, doesn't have anything really, comes and takes on the color of Venus. So here these people become very highly passionate in achieving something. They become more artistic in nature. They become more drawn towards music. They become more drawn towards literature. Libra and Gemini, right? Venus and Mercury. So this access will lead to a person who is more artistically driven. Not so much bothered about too many passions or too much of drive, too much of anger. They are softer people. Libra, it's all about other people. They want to, they are fired up about giving to the masses. Libra is all about the masses. So when Rahu, you take it and stick it in Libra, it becomes about the masses. Okay. See what happens in the second Pada. So in the second Pada, it becomes 
Libra going into Taurus in Navamsha, Rahu and Ketu goes from Aries to Scorpio. So it's a Taurus Scorpio pull. It's the pull between material and emotional gains. Both want gains, but one wants an emotional gain, one wants a materialistic gain. So in this axis, what happens? Vishakha in Taurus, because Libra and Taurus both are ruled by Merc by Venus. Aries and Scorpio both are ruled by Mars. So it's a tussle between Venus and Mars. Detachment from Mars, attachment towards Venus. So wherever Venus is in the chart of this kind of a person and wherever it is falling in, the dispositor Venus will be a strong driver for this Rahu. Okay. You have got to look at where the Venus is. And that's where that will give the disposition of Rahu. That's what, what Rahu wants to achieve. For example, if Venus is sitting in the fifth house, it will do very well because it's a house of creativity, house of education. These people might want to get educated in the field of arts, in the field of culture, in the field of music, that kind of a thing. And it's a very strong driver in this particular Pada. Now let's see the first Pada. In the first Pada, we see a reversal again. See those two tables, tiny tables I have put below Vishakha and Bharani. So now we have gone into Aries, which is proper Bharani. And Rahu here in natal chart is in Libra and Navamsha goes into Aries. On the Ketu on the other side is in Aries in natal and goes into uh, Libra in the Navamsha. So it's Aries to Libra, Libra to Aries. So in the first half of the life they may be more like Libra. In the second half they may be more like Aries. What is the difference? Well the dip dispositor reversal is there. If the dispositor reversal is there, it's take it as a general rule between Navamsha and Natal, there is a flip in the personality type. Meaning, Mars is all about action, action, action. Venus is all about sensitivity, sensitivity, sensitivity. So, there is a flip in personality. If you go from an action-oriented person to being a sensitive person, later on in life, you have a change in personality. That's how powerful Rahu and Ketu can get. Whereas on the other side, if you are detached from it, you are detached from the action side and later on in life you may be attached towards more sensitivity side. You see how these things can flip between one thing to another. But Vishaka theme will remain, which is trying to unify opposing choices, different choices, trying to make up your mind and transformation in the process. Okay. Next one, let's take up Swati Nakshatra. Rahu in Swati Nakshatra and it will transit through Ashwini and Bharani I would think yes it will okay let's take a that meanwhile take care be safe